Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend, he met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy and telling he made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away. Church. Uh, first things first, if any of you forgot to pick up your communion, uh, we have a willing person to pass those out. Just raise your hand uh, for communion if you've missed those. The goes first. Got some up here. Uh, wonderful. It's also so good to see all of you here today, uh, especially if it's your very first time at Southwest. Uh, welcome to Southwest Church of Christ. Please stick around, get to know us. Uh, let's get to know you. Uh, but also, we understand as we gather this morning, it's been another tough week for the nation. Uh, with a lot of stuff happening, especially what happened in Texas. And I don't know what the answer is, uh, but I know that today we gather to glorify the one who does, uh, the one who has justice, the one who has peace and can give comfort, uh, the one that we come to glorify today. Uh, so we take solace in that especially. So despite what's happening in the world and, and all the things that are going on that will continue to go on, uh, we still glorify our God. And we give him all praise, honor, and glory, and we give him control. Uh, so with that, no matter what's happening in your life, uh, we gather to praise our God. Uh, would you please join me in prayer? Father, we thank you so much for this day, and God, for who you are. Uh, God, I pray a very special blessing over those in Texas after what happened this week, and those still suffering from previous things that have happened in the past couple of weeks. Uh, God, I pray, especially for those who are in pain and suffering, uh, God, that your peace that transcends all understanding rests on them. Uh, God, for us this morning to glorify you and still give you all honor and praise and to realize how wonderful you truly are, no matter what happens here. Uh, God, that you have the power, you have the justice, the mercy, and God, in all things we can call on your name and be completely cleansed and completely changed. Uh, God, as we gather together, let's praise your name like never before. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, church. Uh, today's reading is Mark 2, verses 1 through 12. 
A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that, they had, that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowering the mat. Uh, the mat I'm sorry, the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Deeper than the ocean and wider than the sea is the grace of the Savior for sinners like me. Sin from the Father and it thrills my soul just to feel.
Morning, church family. Today, Jim's going to be talking about forgiveness. And I don't know about anybody else, but when I hear the word forgiveness, I think of that phrase that we say so much, we hear so much, I'm sorry. And I think that we hear that and use that a lot of different ways. We can use it like my kids use, where they leave their socks laying around, their trash laying around, lights on all the time glasses not put on their heads. And the thing for me is, is that it's so frustrating to hear over and over and over, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Well, if you were sorry, wouldn't you change the way you're doing things? But God doesn't tell us to think that way. He says, forgive. We can also use I'm sorry the way that my students use I'm sorry. When they get in trouble with cheating or lying or not being where they're supposed to. And the first thing they say is, I'm sorry. And you know that they're not really sorry that they did what they did, but more they're sorry because they got caught. Or how about when people say this golden nugget here, they say, I'm sorry that I'm not sorry. Well, you're not really sorry then. But the one that I love the most is when people say, I'm sorry, and then add the word but on there. I'm sorry, but... And then they continue to go on to say how everything isn't really their fault and they deflect on somebody else and that's the person who you should really be mad about. But in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14, the Bible tells us, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now, it's pretty cut and dry right there. But the point is, is that when we look at that verse right there, you notice it doesn't say forgive people that ask for forgiveness. It says straight up, forgive everyone. And for me, that's the hardest time to forgive people. When they don't think they did something wrong, we still are called to forgive them. I worked with a gentleman years ago that I really believed wronged me. And when I left the job, I was ready to tell him off. I was going to get in his face, and I was going to get mad and scream and yell. And, of course, I never got the chance to, and that anger just kept building and building and building. About a year ago, I saw him at a track meet. And for some weird reason, I just walked up to him, said hello, 
and we had a great conversation. And the thing is, what was weird about it was that after the talk, I completely forgave him, and I never thought about it since. Because God gives us that unbelievable gift of forgiveness. In John cha- or 1 John chapter 1, verses 9, God says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So it's kind of a two-pronged attack right now. We're called to forgive people, but we're also called to ask God to forgive us. We're come to the point in our service of the Lord's Supper where we're going to take the bread and the cup, and we're going to be able to ask God to forgive us. We're going to be reminded of that covenant that if we take him as our Savior and we believe that he is our Lord and continue to ask for forgiveness, someday we'll meet him in heaven. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, you are the great I am. No one can compare to you. Thank you for the gift of the bread of life. We now can have confidence that we'll have eternal life through you. Words cannot fully express our thankfulness. Let this bread fill us with the Holy Spirit that we may go out into the world and forgive like you have forgiven us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. debt he did not owe I owed a debt I could not pay I needed someone to wash my sins away and now I sing a brand new song amazing grace Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never Will you pray with me? Dear God, Jesus made it clear that if we eat the bread and drink the cup, we will have everlasting life. Lord, we believe that you are our saviors, and we remember you and take the cup now. Thank you for watching over us and preparing a place in heaven when our time on earth has come. We ask you to help us to do what we can to honor you here on earth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. He paid a debt at Calvary, he cleansed my soul and set me free. I'm glad that Jesus did all my sins erase. I now can sing a brand new song, amazing grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never I have to be a proud uncle here. Uh, My niece yesterday graduated from Millard West High School. And as they read off the hundreds and thousands and millions of names that walked across the stage, started making me think a little bit about my own graduation. And yes, I graduated a long time ago. But I remember we had a party and people came and gave gifts and cards and money and all those things. And the next day, my mom broke it to me that I had to write a thank you card for every single one of those people. Amazing thing, when I started thinking about it, I still remember exactly what I started the card with. I said, thank you for the gift you gave me. I really appreciate it. I can't wait to use it in college next year, blah, blah, blah. And the thing is, is that after you write a thank you card 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 times, those words start to lose a little bit of meaning. And I think sometimes when we stand up here and we talk about the offering, sometimes we we are thankful and we we want to do well, but at the same time, the words kind of start to lose meaning. So I ask today that when we give our offering, that we think about everything that God has done for us. The fact that he gave his only son to die on the cross. The fact that Jesus was willing to die and to take away our sins. And of course, the unbelievable gift of forgiveness. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for all the things you created that are on earth and are on heaven. You warned us not to store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them 
and where thieves break in and steal, but to store up our treasures in heaven. Please, Lord, guard our hearts that we may, in bringing your offerings to you now, store up our treasures in your kingdom. May your peace guard our hearts and minds in Christ's name. Amen. He's coming back for me to live with him eternally. Won't it be glory to see him on that day? I then will sing a brand new song, amazing grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never. If the kids want to come forward, how many of you have ever heard the song, With Christ as My Vessel, I Can Smile at the Storm? Like my family and anybody who went to church in Columbus, which is basically nobody else. So if we have any of the kids come up, that would be great. We're not going to do the entire thing because that would take way too long. All right. So if we can have the kids come up, we're going to try to learn a new song. All right, you guys want to stand on the stage or do you want to stay down here? You're the center of attention right now, so you can get up there, that's fine. All right, so that everybody can hear what's going to go on, this is what I need you to guys learn to, from, the, from the movements, okay? This is Christ, okay, so with Christ as my vessel. A vessel, normally what do you think for a vessel? That's a word you probably don't know, that's like a ship, all right? So for us, Christ is in our heart. So we're going to say with Christ as my vessel, make a big heart, I can smile. Can you smile for me? All right. So everybody, smile. Smile. At the storm, we got rain coming down. With Christ as my vessel, I can smile at the storm. Smile at the storm. Smile at the storm. With Christ as my vessel, I can smile at the storm as we go sailing on. So we're going to do this, all right? Sailing, sailing home. Sorry, sailing home. Sailing, sailing home. All right? So we'll sing through it a couple times. We'll give it a shot, see what we can do. I have my family up here to support me. That's great. Thank you. All right. You ready? Okay. With Christ as my vessel, I can smile at the storm, smile at the storm, smile at the storm. With Christ as my vessel, I can smile at the storm as we go sailing home. Sailing, sailing home, sailing, sailing home. With Christ as my vessel, I can smile at the storm as we go sailing home. Okay, so we're going to sing it through one more time slow, and then we're going to go fast, and then some other time I'll teach you how to make it really bad. Really? <laughs> All right. With Christ as my vessel, I can smile at the storm. Smile at the storm. Smile at the storm. With Christ as my vessel, I can smile at the storm as we go sailing home. Sailing, sailing home, sailing, sailing home. With Christ as my vessel, I can smile at the storm as we go sailing home. Ready to go faster. With Christ as my vessel, I can smile at the storm, smile at the storm, smile at the storm. With Christ as my vessel, I can smile at the storm as we go sailing home. Sailing, sailing home, sailing, sailing home. With Christ as my vessel, I can smile at the storm as we go sailing home. Yay! All right, you guys can go to junior church. Everybody stand up, please. All right, as Patrick talked about, and if you haven't noticed a lot of the songs, we're talking about grace, forgiveness, mercy. Uh, this is going to be a song before Jim's lesson. Years I spent, spent in vanity and pride, caring that my Lord was crucified. Hopefully we are here because that is not the case for you any longer. Mm -hmm. 
Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. Good morning. What I thought about doing was saying I've changed the topic for this morning, but uh, I don't want to scare y'all. I have not. No, I haven't done that. We've got to be careful about what we consider proof texts. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, you can, you can say something and quote it directly from the Bible and it won't be right. And I'll give you a couple examples. In John chapter 9, there's a man that Jesus heals of blindness. And and there's a big controversy. I mean, uh, they want to kick him out of 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 the synagogue. And they go to his parents and they say... Yeah, he's your son. Did did you know? Did Jesus heal him? And they go, "Oh, well, you better ask him. Uh, he's of age." And and he, they go back to the guy who was healed of, of of blindness, and he says this: "We know God does not listen to sinners." Well, if you pull that out and you say, "Well, <laughs> the Bible says we know that God does not listen to sinners," you could be teaching falsehood. Because, anybody in here not a sinner? Uh, I think you would hope that God would listen to your prayer. Then there's the story of of Job. I I like Job. Uh, It's it's interesting. I I just finished reading his book uh, on Job and uh, the book of Job. And, and, uh, you know, he, he comes... Before these friends, and I put friends in quotation marks, uh, they, they, they go a week. He is in such bad shape. They go a week before they even say anything to him. They are just appalled at the way he looks. He's lost everything. And, and they, 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 they finally come to him, and, and each one of them, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, they, they start saying, and, and in essence... Well, Job, what'd you do? And Job says, I didn't do anything. I, I, I've been blameless. I have followed God. I've done everything that he said. And, and everyone, they take turns just, you know, well, now wait a minute, Job. You've done something because God wouldn't do that to you if you hadn't. 
And finally, this guy named Elihu stands up. And he says, you know what, you guys, he said, I don't like you. You guys have not been honest with Job. And he says this, God is mighty, but God despises no one. He's mighty and firm in his purpose. He does not keep the wicked alive, but he gives the afflicted their rights. He does not take his eyes off the righteous. He enthrones them with kings and exalts them forever. But if people are bound in chains, held fast by cords of affliction, he tells them what they have done, that they have sinned arrogantly. He makes them listen to correction and commands them to repent of their evil. And if they obey and serve him, they will spend the rest of their days in prosperity and their years in contentment. But if they don't listen to him, they will perish by the sword and die without knowledge. All right, so if you take that passage of Scripture and you pull it out of the context that it's in, you're going to say, well, if you want to have prosperity, follow God. But you know as well as I do, there are people, there are evil people out there who do nasty, evil things, and they are blessed economically. In fact, it seems that life really isn't fair because these people continue to prosper. So I know what you're probably saying at this point, Jim, what does this have to do with the lesson today? Well, I love this story that was read earlier. Jesus is in a house and he's teaching people and, and I'm sure he's healing people. And these four guys with their friend who is paralyzed and, and the, the, the paralyzed man is on a mat. And, and you can just see this, this, this crude mat that they're carrying and, and trying. To, and they come to the house and they can't get in the house. You know, I can just hear, excuse me, and, and you've experienced this before. Try to go eat somewhere that's real popular. Uh, you want to get in, and you know it's like, man, I can't even get in to get my name in. Well, that's kind of what's going on here. They can't even get in the house. I would love to hear the conversation that went on. Well, if we can't get in that way, let's go in the roof. And so they go up the side of the house, and they start tearing away the stuff that the roof is made of. Now, go inside the house and see Jesus as he's talking and all of a sudden, something comes down and hits him on the head. And then something else. And then pretty soon you see dust and things and Jesus looks up and he sees a hole. And they've got to make a sizable hole in this thing to get a guy in a mat down through there. And then they lower him down. Now, I want to tell you something. If you can find four friends like that, don't let them go anywhere. Because it's just amazing to me what they have done. They bring this guy to Jesus. Well, I wonder what this paralyzed guy has done. These four friends lower him, and what are Jesus' first words? From Mark chapter 2, he says this. Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, I wonder, I wonder if, and, and we... We kind of touched on this, but the, the basic thought of the day was that if you did something wrong, then God would punish you in some kind of physical way. He would either take away your possessions, he would either take away your health, he would do something along those lines. And I'm wondering if, if that's the prevailing thought of, uh-oh, here comes this guy, and everybody in the room is thinking, Oh, this guy must have really done something bad. And the first things out of Jesus' mouth is, 
your sins are forgiven. What's he done? I think it goes beyond that. And Jesus tells him to take up his mat and go home. Let's read the story again from Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 36. This is another one. I'm sorry. This is another story. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And a woman in that town who had lived a sinful life. I think that's interesting. A sinful life. Some people call her a prostitute. Learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. And so he came there with an, she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. And then she wiped them with her hair and kissed them and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man knew, if he was a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. I hear the music at this time. Dun, 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 you know. And Jesus answered him. Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. And one owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. And neither of them had money to pay him back, and so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them loved him more? And Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. And he says, you've judged correctly. And then he turned towards the woman and he said, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You didn't give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. And you didn't give me a kiss. But this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. And you did not put oil on my head. But she's poured perfume on my feet. And therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. As her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. And then Jesus said to her, your sins are are forgiven. I think we have this concept of God that he's sitting in heaven with a heavenly ledger keeping track of our sins. Uh-oh, that's a bad one. Oh, they did something good. Oh, that one deserves five. And at the end of our lives or when he comes again, he pulls out the heavenly ledger and he says, you know what? You had some, some really, really good things, but you also had some really, really bad things. In fact, the ledger says, away from me, I never knew you. And we say things like, well, you know, God is a God of justice. You know, when I was a young boy, I had this concept of God that he was going to strike us down at any moment. And I remember in a Bible class in York, Nebraska, Louise Hester. I don't know if any of y'all remember Louise. Louise Hester was teaching the class. And I forget if I brought it up. I was just a little boy. But I said something to her about Judgment Day. And I said, you know, I... I I think Judgment Day, there's going to be lightning and storms, and, and it's going to be just, just one of those kind of days. And I'll never forget her response. She said, oh, no. Her face lit up. She had a smile on her face. She said, I think it's going to be a beautiful day. I think the sun's going to be shining. And she said, it'll be a wonderful day. 
You see, she understood. She understood that God is in the forgiveness business. In fact, the Bible says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting, and, and I want you to see this word, not wanting anyone. As far as I know, anyone includes everyone. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God doesn't want us to perish. He, want us, he wants us to come to repentance. And if you don't believe in his long suffering, look at the relationship that he had with the children of Israel. Look at the things that happened with them as they sinned over and over and over and over and over and over again. And he continued to forgive them. There was a time that he would finally come and say, that's it. But the only way you can really describe his reaction to them is long-suffering. And he does the same with us. And he sent his own son to die for us, for goodness sake. And we tend to quote John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But have we continued to read the passage in chapter 3 and verse 17 where he says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. I see two aspects of forgiveness. The first is giving forgiveness. God forgives us. And I know we could get into a big discussion and, and it's, it's for another day. But we have to understand his grace and his mercy. And, and you know, there's going to come a time when perhaps God says, I've had enough. I just don't know where, when it is. But the first aspect is God giving forgiveness. And the second is us receiving forgiveness. There's story after story in the New Testament coming from Jesus about forgiving. Peter comes to him and says, how many times should I forgive? Seven times? And you see the good rabbi would say, all you had to do is forgive three times. So Peter says, three and three is six Oh, but don't like six because that's not a perfect number. Hey, let's add one more to seven and we'll say seven times. And Peter's probably looking around thinking, <laughs> you guys didn't think about that, did you? Seven times. How about if we forgive seven times? Twice as many as the rabbi says plus one. And Jesus says, no, you forgive 70 times seven. Jesus obviously wasn't saying 490 times. He was saying you forgive and you forgive and you forgive and you forgive. And then he tells the story of the unmerciful servant. Guy who owed all kinds of money and his master forgave him. And so he went out, he started getting other people that owed him money. And pretty soon, you know, it got back and, and the master says, what in the world are you doing? I forgave you of this huge sin and yet you're going out and you're getting people to pay you. And he throws them in prison. In the model prayer, it says, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you don't forgive others their sin, your Father will not forgive your sins. But we want justice. We want God to give them what they deserve. Okay. Fair enough. How about you get what you deserve? Colossians chapter 3 says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves 
with compassion. And, and, and by the way, passages like this, I, I just get this calm feeling when I read them. Compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. I don't think it's any debate in this room today that God has forgiven us of a multitude of sins. And he continues. In fact, in 1 John, it says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from our sins. He's not saying you just do whatever you want. But he says, what I want you to do is walk in the light. And the word there in the, in the original language means it's a continual cleansing that he continues to forgive and to forgive. But the other aspect of this is receiving forgiveness. Now, this doesn't sound too hard, does it? And to some it isn't. But to a lot of people it is. Today after services, some of you will go out and eat. And when you're done eating, the waitress, the waiter will bring you a ticket and says, this is how much you owe. And what's going to happen is you're going to get into an argument. You reach and the other person reaches and you sit there and it becomes a tug of war. I'm going to pay this. No, you're not. Yeah, it's my turn. No, it's not. And you get into an argument about this. And what once was a nice cordial conversation has become a confrontation. I used to have to argue with my mother-in-law. Don't ever do that, by the way. But <laughs> I used to have to argue with my mother-in-law. We would rarely... Rarely would we eat out, and if we ate out, it would usually be buy some pizza. And I would try to get to the door and, and pay for it, and she would say, no, Jim, you're not going to do that. And, and I mean, she would, I would get so mad at her. And she would take the money and put it in my pocket or put it somewhere else where, I mean, it was, it was literally a fight over this. Some people are like that in receiving forgiveness. I can't accept that. I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm too bad. No, I can't accept that. And so that was the whole point of Luke chapter 7. This woman had forgiven so much that she was so grateful. And that's what should happen to us is gratefulness, gratitude. But instead what ends up happening is I got to pay for that. I got to work for that. I've got to put in more time on, on, the, on, on the evangelism committee. I've got to do more things. I've got to, 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 to burn out in his kingdom. God says, no, I, I want you to know you don't have to owe me like that. I've told you of people in my life that have been so kind and so gracious. And you do want to pay them back. I had a coach in high school. Oh, man, he'd make us run. Patrick, yeah, I can understand why people don't like track coaches, you know. Uh, he'd make us run. But you know what? I'd do anything for him. He's still alive, believe it or not. I'd do anything for him. Is it because that I feel a, a need that I have to do this and, and that, you know, I'll do it sneakily so he won't see me and that way he'll, you know, do something? That, no, that's not it at all. It comes from an attitude of gratefulness. Either way, don't carry it around. There are some people that carry their sin around and their forgiveness around in a bag, and it just gets heavier and heavier by the day, and they feel more guilty and more guilty and more guilty by the second. I'm no good. Maybe not. 
but Jesus is. And that's what grace is for. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. And in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. Expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works. So that no one can boast. I want you to be forgiven. I, 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 I just, the song that comes to my mind just as I am, and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot. To thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come. In Jesus Christ, we have forgiveness. We have forgiveness of our sins. And he calls us to follow him. We're going to sing an invitation song here in just a moment. If you're struggling with that, uh, don't, don't let that happen. But if you want to get in contact, please, what shall we do? What shall we do to be saved? Peter said, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. He says, you'll be forgiven. If you need to do that today, would you come as we stand and sing this song? Oh, to be like the blessed Redeemer, this is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I'll forfeit all of earth's treasures, Jesus, thy perfect likeness to wear. Oh, to be like thee, oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art. Come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness, stamp thy own Wednesday, believe it or not, is June 1. Can you believe that? Uh, 
June 1, but we, are, we have an exciting month planned. In fact, June the 1st, Wednesday, this Wednesday, Rich Milliken from Kingsway Christian Church will be here to speak to us. Uh, I, I hope that you will be a part of that. That'll be at 7 o'clock Wednesday night. What time is the eating? 5.30. Okay. Uh, and then next Sunday, uh, Jerry and Lynn Jones will begin their Relationships Matter seminar with us. <clears throat> I want to encourage you not to miss any of this, but um, Jerry will be teaching a class of men. Uh, Lynn will be teaching a class of ladies to begin with at 9 o'clock. Lynn will be in the auditorium here. Jerry will be in the gym. And so come and be a part of that. Uh, I know we'll forget and, and uh, you know, you'll, we'll come in here. Just remember uh, that that will be going on uh, this Sunday. Remember Wednesday night at 7, come for, for a meal at 5.30 and then hear Rich at 7. And then after that, uh, next Sunday, uh, Jerry and Lynn Jones will begin their seminar. And uh, if you need a schedule, call us. Uh, we'd be more than happy to tell you. It's most of the afternoon on, uh, on Sunday and uh, a little bit into the evening and then every night at 7 o'clock, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And there'll, there'll be two-hour sessions that, those two hours. So be a part of that. I, I can't emphasize enough uh, how, how good this will be and you will benefit greatly from it. So I hope to see you here for all of the sessions that we have. Good morning. We uh, we do want to thank uh, we do want to welcome all of you who are here today, and we have a lot of visitors. We have a lot of, of people, former members, the popes, the Tetons, and I'm probably missing somebody that is that is here today. We're so glad that you are here. Uh, we also uh, I'd like to announce that uh, the family of Jackie Moore Foster is here today, and we welcome you, and we uh, we miss Jackie. And, uh, but we welcome you and we're glad that, that you could be with us today uh, here and, uh, and over this Memorial Weekend. Um, we, uh, Jim's taking care of a lot of the announcements for me, so I don't know how much more I need to say. Now, John just told me that if somebody, if people would like to help set up for the uh, meal on Wednesday night, uh, if you could be here a little early, 4.30 to 5.00, uh, help set up tables back there. Uh, it is a potluck, um, and so that will begin at 5.30, and then, uh, uh, then uh, Rich Milliken will be speaking at 7. Also, next Sunday, in conjunction with Jerry Jones, there will be a meal provided uh, that will be brought in uh, right after services uh, for people to enjoy as well. So please look at that schedule and... Uh, uh, we have a lot going on here in the next uh, couple of weeks, so uh, uh, please uh, be a part of that. Um, I guess one other thing John mentioned to me, uh, Phyllis Kieser and Chris Cox are kind of coordinators on this meal, so if you have any questions, those would be the people to call. Um, there's also, in the midst of all this, a come-and-go shower for... Uh, uh, the twin baby boys keep. So uh, uh, we uh, encourage you to, uh, to be a part of that as well. Um, this is Memorial Day weekend, and uh, it's a time when we, when we remember those that have passed, that we remember those who have sacrificed uh, their lives for us uh, in, uh, in fields of battle. And it's time that we... Uh, enjoy with family uh, but let's keep in mind those who have lost and, and obviously there's been tragic events in the last week uh, in Texas and, and other places we continue to remember what's going on in Ukraine and, and elsewhere and uh, uh, it's a good time to take a few moments and, and remember uh, those that we've lost and celebrate those the lives that they led. So, let's uh, let's pray now, and uh, as we wrap up our service, dear Father, we thank you so much 
for all that you've done for us. We're thankful uh, to see uh, uh, members here who we haven't, who, who have moved on and moved to other places and that we haven't seen in a while. We're thankful for the opportunity to be with family uh, on this weekend. But Father, we pray that we will not lose sight that, uh, that this is Memorial Day. That this is a day that we remember those that have, have passed on, that th those who have sacrificed their lives for uh, our freedoms. And Father, we, we just pray that you will uh, be with us and that we'll be able to have good memories of, uh, of those uh, who have gone before. Father, it is so good to know that we are forgiven that as we go through this life, whatever it may bring us, and whatever, whenever our time is up, that you have forgiven us and that you are there to welcome us home. Father, we thank you again for the lesson that was preached today. We're thankful for the chance to be together. We pray that you will bring us together uh, again soon, and we have many activities planned over the next week and a couple of weeks and month, and we just pray that we'll be able to take advantage of those opportunities to uh, worship with each other, to hear your word proclaimed, and to enjoy uh, our time together. Father, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. He is able, more than able. Do you believe that? <clears throat> Do you believe that? Yes. We've got to learn how to receive the forgiveness. Would you please stand, and I want you to sing this song with conviction in a way that will take you through the next week in all of your life. He is able, more than able. He is able, more than able, to accomplish what concerns me today. He is able, more than able, to handle anything that comes my way. that shares a God who is able. You're dismissed.